Thank you very much. I'll try to be fast uh, so that uh, I manage to give my presentation before the blood disappears from brain uh, uh, to deal with a beautiful, uh, delicious lunch. Um, anyway, so my talk is about uh, fusion of uh, uh, multi-class systems and uh, uh, in a way the focus will be on errors. Not so much perhaps to indicate how they can be estimated because that's still a difficult problem, but uh, uh, to uh, get some suggestions how one perhaps should do fusion uh, to exploit uh, the available information. So uh, this is the plan and uh, I will be uh, focusing on very simple fusion strategies, uh, just uh, some basically uh, in the context of uh, product also, but uh, that has uh, also implications on other fusion strategies uh, which are based on uh, learning. Uh, so the, uh, well, if one wants to fuse information, uh, then uh, this can be done in uh, different ways at various levels. And uh, uh, I've been working on various applications, including biometrics. So some of the examples will be from biometrics. But uh, basically, it can be done uh, uh, at as low level as uh, uh, sensor data level. Um, it can be done at feature level, score level, or decision level. And uh, uh, although a uh, long time ago, I think uh, I've, I've been uh, focusing on score level fusion. Uh, more recent work was on feature level fusion using uh, kernel approaches. So basically that uh, uh, led to uh, the problem of uh, fusing multiple kernels and uh, how to do the weighting, um, how to establish uh, uh, appropriate weighting uh, for kernels so that you get good performance and uh, uh, anyway, so this, this certainly produced very good results, but uh, since my earlier work on uh, uh, multiple classifier fusion, um, I've always been interested in understanding uh, what uh, happens when one fuses information and uh, uh, and even at the simplest level when you are using uh, fusion, averaging as fusion or basically some fusion. So the problem I'm going to consider is uh, one of decision making and uh, I'm going to uh, consider also Bayesian framework. So not uh, necessarily machine learning formulation of the problem. Uh, because uh, for me at least it gives a little bit more insight in what's going on. So we have some uh, classes which we try to identify using uh, measurements and uh, the assumption is that uh, there are some underlying uh, a posteriori probability functions which we want to uh, compute and uh, make decisions on that basis. And of course, um, although I will be using or discussing things in the Bayesian framework, um, uh, what I will be talking about applies more or less to any classification uh, approach because you can always uh, rescale uh, the scores produced by any classifier into uh, probabilities, a posteriori probabilities, and uh, so what I will be discussing uh, applies also there. Okay. Now, in principle, I'm interested in multi-class problems, but uh, even if you have uh, multiple classes, in most cases, there are usually just two competing hypotheses. So one can take the two-class problem as a, an example of uh, what's going on. And uh, so this is what I will be doing and uh, looking at it in more detail. So if you have a two-class problem, and this is just in one-dimensional case. Okay, so very simple problem. Uh, here I have uh, uh, my a posteriori probability functions, and uh, if I want to decide about the class membership of this uh, measurement, then I compute the a posteriori probability. 
value and uh, make decision. Basically, uh, using the Bayesian rule, assign the observation into the most probable class. Now that's, uh, of course, uh, in theory. In practice, we have a problem that uh, when we try to compute these functions, then uh, they will be subject to estimation errors. And this is what is illustrated by, this, uh, by these functions. Okay, so nominally, this is what I'm trying to compute, this value, which is the a posteriori, the underlying true a posteriori class probability. But uh, in uh, practice, I will get a value which will be drawn from this uh, distribution, which hopefully will be uh, centered on the value that I want, or not necessarily, but it will give me some uh, measurement of the a posteriori probability which will deviate from the uh, true value that I'm after, and uh, then various things can happen. Well, if I, for instance, get an error which will tell me, well, the estimate is uh, bigger than the true value, then no problem. I will still make the same decision. Uh, my max uh, a posteriori uh, selection uh, will still give me the same class, okay? So I will go for class one. The problem arises when my error is unfavorable and uh, I get it uh, somewhere there. And uh, if I, because in this two class case, actually the errors, because the a posteriori probabilities have to sum up to one, then the errors uh, will be the same just with opposite sign. So the other one will go the other way and will, be, uh, will give me a bigger value for class two and I will make an error. So in principle, uh, I will be making errors when uh, I get unfavorable errors and uh, the error that I will be making or the probability of making error will be given by uh, the area under the tail of the error distribution. Okay, so if you imagine, uh, well, this is my error distribution and uh, if this is uh, sort of cut off and if I get below that cut off and it's defined by the margin that I have, if I get below the cutoff, then uh, I will be making error. So anything under my error distribution in this uh, tail area will uh, produce an error. And, uh, and I'm interested in, uh, well, this, this, this is what will actually give rise to my recognition errors. Now, that's an error in addition to the irreducible error. I cannot do anything about the Bayesian error because uh, the Bayesian error is basically a uh, uh, question of ambiguity. I have an observation which could come from either class. I just don't have enough information in the observation to disambiguate to two classes. But uh, if I, also because of the measurement error, if I uh, uh, get the estimate the uh, wrong way round, then there will be an additional error. And um, incidentally, uh, because of the, uh, uh, the fact that the errors uh, on my, est uh, on my estima estimation errors are the same with opposite sign, then it gives me uh, the uh, effective error distribution and uh, what uh, the probability that I will be making error is de defined by the margin. And margin is the distance between the a posteriori, competing a posteriori probabilities. So, if I'm somewhere in a safe area where I have a huge distance, then even if I make errors in my estimates, then the margin will be sufficient for me not to hit, uh, not to have anything under the tail. But uh, in, uh, when, as soon as I get close to the boundary between classes, then uh, the situation gets worse and worse. Of course, at the boundary, who cares? Because you can just uh, choose uh, decisions randomly. But uh, the closer you are to the boundary, the smaller the margin will be and uh, more probable it will be that uh, you will make an error. So the actual error that uh, you will then observe is, uh, can be shown very easily to be given by this expression where this is the probability of um, label switching and this is the probability which uh, is computed 
uh, by uh, what is under the tail of my error distribution. So you can see that if this uh, uh, probability is zero, then I will end up with Bayesian error, uh, with base error. Uh, if it is non-zero, then it will be greater. Anyway, so that's, that's that. And uh, so why multiple classifiers? Uh, in principle, you could just go for the best one, and this is what people used to do. They would uh, design many different classifiers, find out which one worked best, pick it, and uh, use it for their application. It turns out that if you actually use many of your designs, not necessarily all of them, but uh, many of your designs, then you can uh, achieve better performance than with the best single design. And uh, so this is uh, where the multiple classifier fusion comes in, very much like um, when you try to get consensus from uh, opinion from a number of experts, okay, if you are seeking medical diagnosis or whatever, then uh, usually you would like to get uh, views from uh, more than one doctor. Okay, so in principle, when you design multiple classifier systems, then you can exploit uh, a lot of different things. Um, you can exploit complementary information in the case of multimodal systems, and uh, I will come to that later. Uh, but uh, you can exploit also complementary information provided by different designs. So all these different classifiers which can uh, work uh, better or worse and, uh, and uh, com combining them to get uh, better results. And you can also exploit contextual information, which is what you all do in, tech, uh, in speech processing and whatever. So uh, why uh, does it uh, help to make use of uh, different designs? Well, this is an example. So supp suppose I have two class problem illustrated here uh, by this uh, uh, data. And uh, if I, for instance, assume or build a classifier which is linear, then maybe this is uh, going to be the best solution. Incidentally, this is identical data, so the base error is exactly the same for both, okay? Uh, but uh, here, because uh, this is the area where I cannot do anything uh, to um, overcome the problem that the classes are overlapping and I have ambiguity and I will have some error, whatever. But in this area, just by choosing different uh, function, I uh, uh, avoid this, uh, this problem where I'm actually making the wrong decisions. So, and uh, implicitly what I'm doing here is using different feature space, okay? But uh, even if you are transforming your data in, uh, by some nonlinear function to another space, it does not uh, help you with uh, points which are overlapping and because you cannot uh, disambiguate. And uh, the whole idea is that if you use multiple designs, well, each of them will give you slightly different observation, okay? And uh, you know very well that when you combine measurements uh, already from physics uh, a long time ago, uh, if you take several measurements and combine them, you get better results. Uh, in a sense that you get better estimate of the mean value and you get also smaller variance. Uh, so this is exactly the same sort of thing happening here that uh, we are hoping that our uh, error distribution will shrink. The underlying problem doesn't change. I still have the same margin, okay? But you can see now that the margin is uh, extending uh, quite beyond my, uh, the tail of my distribution, which has much smaller variance. So this is the uh, estimate which I obtained by combining information from the different classifiers. And this can be, so how can I make various uh, different designs? So you have uh, many things that can be varied and uh, use different models, different architectures, uh, different feature spaces, and. Uh, and uh, the list continues because uh, you can also play with, uh, uh, with your training set. You can use uh, bagging techniques and, or change your training set by noise injection. 
uh, you can play with uh, initialization parameters, etc., etc. Et so this is a uh, sort of basic idea that uh, you use multiple designs to reduce the width of your error distribution and get a better estimate. Now the problem is that this very simple idea doesn't extend uh, very simply to the case when you have uh, multimodal data because in principle if you have multimodal data then each modality has a different base error or gives you features of features in the space uh, uh, where the overlap of classes will be different so it becomes uh, uh, more complicated but anyway so we are basically uh, in the case of multimodal when you build your classifiers from uh, to, uh, to work with different modalities, uh, you are sort of exploiting complementary information. And um, in the uh, probabilistic approach, well, what you really want to do is to compute this a posteriori probability, which is the same as before. The only uh, difference is that now I have uh, different uh, modalities and there the, are therefore different observations. And uh, you can see immediately that you cannot write it that way in the case when you have just uh, uh, one feature space and uh, you are designing different classifiers because your measurements are always the same. But here we have uh, different complementary measurements, so we are computing a posteriori probability based on this joint occurrence of all these uh, different modalities. And um, in some applications, like in biometrics, which I've been interested in, you can make the assumption that uh, face is independent on fingerprint, of course, um, um, only if you ignore DNA, but uh, anyway. Uh, so, and uh, your f face is also independent of voice, etc. And if you make that assumption, then you can, uh, through manipulation, express this in terms of a product of actually um, marginal classifiers, in other words, component classifiers, each of them just uh, working uh, with data corresponding to that modality. So this is uh, what we have here. And uh, so you can use this, uh, this is obviously a product rule. There are some factors which are just function of data, so they will not enter the decision making or influence the decision making process. And uh, you can just end up with a product rule. And uh, Early on, there was an um, argument whether uh, averaging or uh, issue is better than uh, uh, product rule, product rule fusion, etc. And uh, so we looked at that a long time ago and showed that uh, if you actually consider some estimation errors on your a posteriori probabilities and assuming the errors are not too large, then you can show that the product rule gets affected by estimation errors much more than some rule, and uh, so that uh, support for, uh, for some rule. Now, in that particular analysis, what was completely ignored, that uh, potentially you can have dependence between your modalities, and uh, if you do, then the situation becomes uh, much more complex. But uh, anyway, it's complex enough just for uh, even under the assumption of independence. Uh, and basically what happens is that uh, when, you are, when you have estimation errors, what actually happens, well, I don't want to go back to that formula uh, after such a big lunch, uh, but uh, uh, what happens is that uh, the errors get amplified by dividing by a value which is less than one by the actual a posteriori probabilities and this is why the uh, product rule doesn't work so well. Uh, whereas some rule works very well, and one can actually show that you get sort of uh, attenuation of errors, but um, the only way uh, at that, when we actually looked at that um, some 15 years ago uh, now, uh, the, we were able to show it and to go from product rule to some rule by on the very sort of, uh, strong assumptions that uh, the ratio between uh, the a posteriori probability and prior probability was very small. So basically you are talking about uh, uh, 
uh, data which is providing very little information in addition to what you had when, uh, from the knowledge of your priors. And uh, so it was very strong assumption uh, under which you could show that the product rule could simplify into some rule. And once you have a sum, then the sensitivity of the sum to errors is actually attenuated because every error for every modality, the error on the estimate of the prior is divided by a term which is summation of uh, probabilities, a posteriori probabilities of all the other modalities. So that's, uh, you know, that was very uh, promising. And uh, so in spite of this hair raising assumption about uh, and that allow us to go from product to sum, um, the paper was uh, accepted because uh, this was uh, so considered as a good, uh, uh, good result. And, uh, but anyway, I've always found it very unsatisfying that uh, you know, there must be a better way of explaining what's actually happening when you are summing uh, probabilities uh, or, or outputs of uh, multiple classifiers. How am I doing? Okay. And this is, uh, so this was introduction to my talk, but uh, the talk will be uh, very short now. Uh, okay, so basically, when you have uh, multiple modalities, then uh, well, you can look at it as uh, constructing a feature space, which is uh, combined of all your modalities. So if you imagine that you had all these uh, feature vectors, so these are not uh, just uh, components, uh, scalars, but uh, x1 is a vector, which is the representation that comes from your modality one, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I have these uh, R modalities, and if I combine them into a uh, feature vector, then what I, uh, what, uh, I can look at the uh, averaging operation, which is what I do if I want to sum up the outputs of my a posteriori class probabilities coming from the various modalities, okay? In a, in a way, you could say, well, it doesn't make sense. They all estimate a posteriori probability for distribution, which have different Bayesian error and this and that. But uh, you can look at it that they are actually all estimates of the uh, ultimate thing you are after, which is the a posteriori probability of your class in this combined space, okay? Of course, the question is how good these estimates are. Uh, but anyway, basically what uh, we have, or we are interested in, is the estimation error, which is the difference between the underlying, and this is the, uh, uh, a posteriori probability function in the complete space, which has some underlying Bayesian error associated with it. And uh, I'm looking at uh, how good my estimate of that a posteriori probability is as defined on the previous slide. So just taking a difference between those two. And um, the, the way, uh, in this simple way, uh, the averaging, uh, is, well, the, the fusion is defined it's very easy to show that you can actually express this um, error as in this form, okay? So basically what you have is the, uh, well, uh, the difference is expressed with respect to the target base error, but uh, uh, what you are computing is a difference between these two quantities. So it's the underlying base error in each modality, okay, that's my, uh, this quantity EB, XL, corresponding to the modality L. But uh, I cannot obviously achieve that error with my classifier designed uh, for that modality. Uh, I will be, have some other error. There will be an estimation error plus structural error. Because if I choose, for instance, a linear classifier rather than, a, um, I don't know, a kernel method, a discriminant analysis, then I will uh, potentially have some structural error, so there will be some uh, estimation error which includes the structural error, and uh, the structural error adds additional bias. So this adds bias with respect to that, okay? The Bayesian error adds bias with respect to the 
uh, underlying Bayesian error in the complete space. And in addition, I have some structural error plus estimation error uh, on, uh, in, involved in the design of my individual modality. So various things to note. OK, so uh, we had some paper mm, some time ago. Uh, uh, I had an RA who started, uh, he came to look at uh, classifier fusion. And he was um, coming from astronomy. So, um, and was a physicist by training. So he said, well, well why don't we solve it by tomographic uh, reconstruction? And uh, anyway, so basically uh, he considered the a posteriori probability estimates, which are in these various subspaces associated with individual modalities, he considered them as projection of the uh, density function from uh, the complete observation space into subspaces. And basically, the tomographic reconstruction allows you to use these projections to reconstruct uh, the actual values. Uh, anyway, so in a way, I think what uh, there is some connection with that, but. Uh, we didn't come up with any specific algorithm that would allow uh, fusion at that point. Anyway, so I already mentioned this um, and uh, the estimation error because it may include some structural uh, error uh, uh, will not necessarily be zero mean, so it introduces additional bias. And uh, uh, so two interesting things are happening. Just at looking at uh, Mm, uh, this very simple first order statistics that uh, we are, by adding more and more modalities, we are reducing the base error. Okay? So this is uh, reducing, which is good because potentially I can do better in a space which has um, the un underlying base error is lower. The problem is that what I'm doing is that I'm estimating this uh, quantity using a much cruder tool and um, because of the projections into the respective modalities will me give me bigger difference between the base error there and uh, the overall base error. And also I have uh, this uh, potential bias from the structural error. Okay, so that's, um, but I'll come back to that um, in a minute. Now what happens to variance? Well, if I look at my error estimate, so this is error on the uh, a posteriori probability I'm after. And if I subtract the mean, which is uh, the expected value of my, uh, of my estimate, then I end up with variance. And this uh, variance can be, again, I'm not going through the mathematics here, but it can be expressed in this uh, form. So I have a sum of in the variances of the component classifiers of the individual modalities, okay? Now, if you consider, I have one over R square. Uh, so if you consider one over R times some of these variances, that would be sort of mean variance of my component classifiers. So if I, they will not have the same variance, estimation error variance, but uh, if I just take uh, some sort of uh, uh, very rough uh, measure, the mean variance, then uh, you can see that mean variance will be scaled down by another factor of R, because I use only one of these R's from the R square term to compute the mean, and that mean is then scaled by factor one over R. So when I'm fusing more and more classifiers, I'm driving the variance down, hopefully. I will be driving it down if the covariance term is zero. It would be zero if my uh, modalities produce independent estimation errors. So that's um, um, a consideration. But it could be even better because the covariances can be negative. And uh, if the, on average, this term is negative, then actually it will reduce the variance even more. I mean, it, so although, so what is happening, you know, when I am, and I really would need a, a drawing of a, a posterior probability functions in multidimensional space and the projections, et cetera, et cetera. But what's happening is that by including just, uh, I will project everything into one dimension. 
by including more and more classifiers, I am subraising this uh, function and making it uh, uh, less, uh, well, reducing the ambiguity, reducing the Bayesian error. But because of the way I am estimating the value of that function through my individual modalities, I am actually introducing more and more bias. So my uh, error distribution on my estimate doesn't necessarily, no longer sits on, uh, with its mean value on uh, this improved uh, a posteriori probability function. It shifts down, so I've illustrated here, uh, here by this green function. It shifts down, potentially. I have greater variance, but because I get more and more shrinking of the variance, it doesn't matter if I, even if it came down almost to 0.5, but I had a direct delta function in terms of variance at that point, I would still be doing better than uh, or uh, avoid the problem of uh, uh, adding classification error over the base. Okay. Uh, well, I'm. So just a few more comments. Actually, I already said this because uh, uh, these are. So this is an important point. Um, so far, we talked just about a single point in our observation space. And uh, uh, so you can see that it's already complicated there. Now, when you are estimating the performance of your system, you are integrating over the whole observation space, so taking the expected value operation uh, of your variables over the whole space. And it's clear from this that in some parts of the space, some classifiers can be uh, doing better for resolving uh, the recognition problem than others, and in other parts of the space, uh, vice versa. So making a decision about uh, which classifier to use or not globally is a dangerous thing. You are uh, so averaging good things with bad things, and then you are comparing the results of the averaging, uh, and this may not necessarily uh, give you a good solution. Um, another important point to, uh, to note, that once I design my expert, uh, uh, my classifiers for each modality, they will always, they will not act probabilistically. They will always, for any uh, observation, re uh, regardless how many times I present it, they will always produce the same number. So uh, how do we actually get uh, some variability? Well, that can be done by some of the techniques I already uh, discussed. Uh, uh, in other words, uh, use different designs, bagging, noise injection, etc. But uh, that still leaves the question of uh, uh, of deciding which classifiers or combination of classifiers is good or not uh, open because it cannot be done properly if it is averaged over the whole space, if it is, done, if it is uh, worked out globally. So uh, there are various possibilities. You could do some pruning, but it would have to be a local pruning. Uh, you could do some selection. Uh, so halfway house is to do some soft weighting. In other words, say, well, locally, I would like uh, to combine the classifiers with uh, uh, local weights. They are, these weights cannot apply uh, across the whole uh, space. They will not be the same. And um, the question is uh, how to do it. And uh, uh, anyway. I've got, uh, we have tried it in uh, some way, but uh, this is uh, something that I want to do in the future. Uh, there have been, uh, in the kernel discriminant analysis literature, uh, there, there has been, uh, I think, very little work, probably just one paper I can think of, uh, which is um, using locally sensitive kernels, uh, or developing a solution to kernel discriminant analysis, which is uh, locally sensitive, uh, so it, adapts the fusion process uh, locally rather than having a single fusion uh, waiting for uh, any observation that you have. And that, uh, so from our point of view, from so fusion of classifiers point of view, if my uh, classifier outputs 
are some scores, uh, and my input uh, measurements xi are these measurements for each individual modality. So each xi produces some score si. Okay. What I'm looking for is some sort of weighting matrix, which uh, would uh, associate the inputs to the scores and uh, apply, uh, uh, establish appropriate weighting, uh, which would uh, uh, give me hopefully a good solution. And uh, uh, this can be done through machine learning. Okay, five minutes. Uh, well, just to tell you that uh, we haven't solved the problem the, the way uh, I indicated. We are uh, just uh, currently doing it or looking at it. But we have done some similar work in the context of fusion of biometric modalities using quality information. And you can see that, so this would be a standard fusion. You have all these different modalities and you fuse it in some way, some or even machine learning fusion scheme, uh, but it could be just summation. Uh, this is the same system, but here we have the input observation feed in into a uh, quality uh, measurement which you can use either directly or through clustering into and enter it, um, allow it to enter the fusion process. Or this is the scheme which we want to try in future and uh, use the measurements from the uh, input also in the fusion process in some way so that we end up with locally sensitive weighting. Um, I've got some results on one of the methods that we use, but anyway, um, let me uh, finish with uh, the conclusion that uh, this um, very simple analysis uh, throws a little bit of light on the various uh, processes that go, uh, that enter the uh, estimation process when we deal with uh, classifier a posteriori probabilities. And uh, uh, anyway, so apart from hopefully aiding understanding of what's happening, it also suggests how the problem should be solved in future, and this is uh, what we are planning to do in our field, and hopefully you can do it in text processing. Thank you very much.
in uh, conjunction with the output of the classifiers to uh, establish uh, uh, to find a solution and the so solution turns out to produce local weighting okay so depending on the input variable which is what comes from here the way you combine these guys will change but this is not a completely new idea I think um, uh, Versions of that idea already uh, appeared some time ago with the uh, stack generalization of Wolpert, for instance, uh, who generates uh, outputs of classifiers and then adds these outputs to the input class, uh, data and uh, generates basically another classifier. And in a way, it's uh, similar to deep learning, whatever. I mean, if you have several stages of that, then uh, you could probably find a parallel uh, there. So, it probably goes along those lines. And what we are planning to do is to find a simple association between the inputs and uh, outputs so that you get, uh, again, locally uh, dependent weighting of the value in the combination. No, they don't, and this is why, for instance, uh, uh, for the biometric application, so it's slightly different because in uh, the, I have some results, but uh, we don't have time to go to that, but basically we are trying to control fusion process by using quality information. So, and that's, uh, so the quality information about the input data is a function of the input data, so you can say that well, it's like using the input data, just that it goes through some function. Unfortunately, when you talk about quality, it's, uh, it doesn't have any discriminatory information. It just uh, tells you something about quality of the signal, uh, but uh, regardless of what class it is. And uh, we found that uh, when we use uh, uh, many of these uh, quality variables, for instance, for phase, we had about 15 different quality measures. Uh, when you use them, uh, then uh, uh, you have small number of uh, uh, discriminative scores coming from your modalities, and you add to it a long list of uh, variables which have no discriminatory information, and it didn't uh, work as well as we wanted. So it improved a little bit, but uh, not much. So we found that by clustering, the quality information, so adding another stage, then uh, uh, the situation constantly improved and we got uh, good results with that. Thank <laughs> you. 